Okay. Today we're looking at the Brighton Star F2 manual ultra wide lens for Fujifilm and APS-C cameras. It's a relatively unknown brand and lens that is frequently sold and found online for under $200, far cheaper than its competitors. Almost half of the competing and well-known Rokinon 12 mm F2 ultra wide manual lens. Currently on the market is the cheapest ultra wide non fisheye lens for APS-C cameras. But, 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 is any good. We'll be testing this budget lens with my Fuji X-H1 to see how well it performs. At under $200, we're going to answer the question, is it good value, especially from the perspective of a videographer? Or does it cut too many corners? You can learn more about this lens as well as find the lowest price using the affiliate link down below. Doing so, as you know, really helps support this channel and helps me keep making videos like these. So let's start with a quick cinematic that I took at the park the other day, then we'll go ahead and talk about the pros and the things I don't really like about this lens. So what do you think about that? Before we get into the details of the lens, check this out. My latest Xbox One X render. Anyone else a fan of 3D art, rendering, modeling, and all that? I wanna actually share more of my outside artwork here. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter, and you can see the latest things I'm working on there. Also, you'll probably notice that I have autofocus on, not manual focus, like I've been doing in the past, and I don't know how that's gonna perform. I'm actually testing this out for a future lens review. This is the new Viltrox 23mm f1.4, which recently got released, and after about a month of waiting on shipping, it finally came. So we'll be checking that out in a future video. So stay tuned for that one. With things being pretty crazy now, it makes it pretty hard to go out and shoot more B-roll examples to share here. But from the past couple of months, I actually did manage to use the lens a bit, especially in low light. So we can include and kind of analyze those examples later on in the video. Compared to the more recent lenses I've reviewed on the channel, including the Samyang 85mm, as well as the Pergear 25 f1.4, this fixed ultrawide is one of the more unique ones, but also one of the more difficult ones to get great results from. I'll let you know what I think this lens works best for, but let's start with the specs. Physically, build quality is really good. It's pretty compact, it's got an all metal body which feels well built and pretty durable. Compared to say a more budget priced yet really good value lens, the Pergear 25mm which I reviewed last time, it gives you that extra sense of sturdiness. Even the lens hood, which I have to go get, even the lens hood is all metal, which is a surprise because almost every other lens hood I've gotten with my cameras has been plastic. The other interesting thing about it, which is unusual for lenses, is that it screws on. If I can get it on, there we go. 
focusing is really smooth on this, which I found pretty easy to get used to when taking photos and videos. So if you're using this for video like I like to do and do B-roll and all that kind of cool jazz, you'll really appreciate that. Likewise, your aperture ring is also smooth, although I prefer ones with the click style. Despite their size differences, these don't feel that different in weight. It's 300 grams and just under three inches tall. So either if you're limited on space or you want to travel light, it's not going to be a deal breaker to add this to your kit. It goes from F2 to F22 with a minimum focus distance of about seven inches. I was actually surprised how similar the specs between this and the 12 millimeter Rokinon, which is more expensive, are. They appear to be nearly identical in terms of weight, size, and minimum focus distancing. Being that it is so wide compared to other manual lenses I've used, again like the Sam Yang and this Per Gear, I found it much easier to get usable footage from hand holding it and manual focusing just because of how wide it is. That said, if you are planning on hand holding this, especially for video, you are still going to benefit from a camera like the X-H1, which I primarily shoot on because it offers IBIS as well as 120 FPS slow motion. What's really cool is that minimum focus distance of about 7 inches allows you to get some really cool wide angle scenes, yet you can still get some really incredible depth of field. On the other hand, I wouldn't say that this is a good lens for up-close portraits just because of the way it kind of distorts your face. Instead, wide angles like this are more suited towards landscapes, real estate, and astrophotography. I primarily got this to add to my kit when I do real estate photography for my clients and they need to capture like an entire room or section of the house, whereas my 18 to 135 doesn't do that too well. And I don't really have any other lens that can kind of get such a wide angle easily. Additionally, I've also loved using this for my top-down unboxings just because I can get the entire table and show everything that I'm unboxing and I don't have to keep rearranging or tightly constrain what my workspace is because of how wide that field of view is. I haven't yet had a chance to test it out for real estate photography as well as find a good place to do it for astrophotography yet just because of everything that's going on. In a future video, once things kind of get back into their routine, I'll hopefully be able to revisit that and check those out and we can do a follow-up video talking about what it's like doing it for astrophotography and hopefully I can include some of my client real estate work in there too. So we'll follow up with those tests in a future video. So how's the actual quality on this? I'm gonna focus mostly on the video side of things but I'll include a few images here and there. I found this to be pretty good for daylight video shoots. And I'll talk more about the low light performance and kind of my concerns with that towards the end of the video. The results you get with good lighting makes your images look pretty flattering. Like we said earlier, it does also offer that pretty unique perspective of shallow depth of field yet a wild field of view at the same time. While you can lower your f-stop to f2, it has a lot of downsides to that. This is where some of the shortcomings come into light. Interestingly, I found that this lens is actually probably better suited for videographers compared to photographers, especially at lower f-stops from like f6 to f2. There's a lot of vignetting and some people might kind of like that stylistic look I myself am not one of them I always think it's better to add it in post if that's your desire as opposed to having it baked into your image already likewise you lose a lot of sharpness in those corners for photographers especially pixel peepers and you want to crop in your images a lot this might be a deal breaker for you whether it's landscape photography astrophotography you'll notice in those corners you're losing a lot of the detail there especially like we said at those lower f-stops for video personally I don't notice it that much but in the photo example Examples I did take, especially zooming in, you, you do quickly notice them. While center sharpness is overall pretty good, as you move outwards, that lack of sharpness becomes much, much more noticeable. Now circling back to low light, f2, yes, is great at letting in more light to your lens, but like we just covered, it does result in more vignetting. Your images in the corners are going to look darker. But, 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 but an even bigger concern for me that I found was the light flaring, especially looking at lampposts or any other bright light source in your image. At lower f-stops, it's very very prominent and it'll probably ruin your image or your video if that's a subject you either can't get out of frame or you're trying to capture. Depending on what you're trying to film, many of your shots might not be usable and this lens might not be a great if even viable low light solution for you. Now despite all that you can still get really great and really unique shots like we discussed but you'll need to keep in mind what it's good at as well as where it lacks. Keeping in mind its price and determining what you'll primarily use this for will help you decide if this is a good value and a good buy for you. Now yes, depending if you go the new or used route for either this lens or the Rokinon 12 millimeter ultra wide or even a Sam Yang, you'll probably get a much better image overall with those. But keep in mind, those do sell for about $100 to $150 more than this, basically almost double the price. For what I'm going to shoot, is that other lens twice the value of two of these? No. Is it worth the cost of about two of these? Maybe it is, especially if you think you're going to be doing a lot of professional work. Like I said, if you're primarily using this for video during the day, I think it's a pretty good choice and probably the best value ultra wide lens out there. If you're trying to do more nighttime shots or you're primarily a photographer on the other hand and you'll be pixel peeping and you really care about overall sharpness, 
and the lack of vignetting, maybe not. You can learn more about this lens again using the affiliate links down below and helping support the channel. Thank you for doing that. Be quiet turn. But that's it for this one. Is this a good ultra wide for you? Let me know what you think about this lens down below, either if you've tried it or you think you'll check it out. And until the next one, 